welcome you to our worship this beautiful first Sunday of Lent. Uh, one of our Lenten practices uh, will be to begin the service with the penitential order. And for the first Sunday, we're also going to uh, hear the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. God's mercy endures forever. Hear the commandments of God to his people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not invoke with malice the name of the Lord your God. Amen. Lord have mercy. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Amen. Lord have mercy. Honor your father and your mother. Amen. You shall not commit murder. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not commit adultery. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not steal. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not be a false witness. Amen. Lord have mercy. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Amen. Lord have mercy. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations. And as you know the weakness of each of us, let each one find you mighty to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May be seated for the lesson. A reading from Genesis. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good. So the, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, she, the, and she desired that would make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the, tree, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. See, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherub and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. After Jesus was baptized, he was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. And the tempter came and said to him, hmm, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Well, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him. And suddenly angels came and waited on him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Just the other day, as we started Lent, Ash Wednesday, we were gathered in here and received the imposition of ashes with those majestic words, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Those words actually come out of the Hebrew scripture. In, in fact, they, they come from the end of the little vignette, the story that we have this morning from Genesis, the third chapter in Genesis, in kind of the epilogue of all of that, as, as Adam and Eve have been expelled from Eden, and God sends them forth with those words, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return, those first humans. And yet that contrasts so starkly with another passage from the Hebrew scripture from Psalm 8. Yet you have made them a little lower than the angels, and have crowned humans with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, O Lord, our sovereign. How majestic is your name in all the earth. So somehow, both and always, those two things are true. We are dust, and to dust we shall return. But we've been made just a little lower than the angels. In a very light but curious way, I was kind of reminded of that tension on Ash Wednesday. Father Tom and I 
uh, shared duties all morning, although he took the early service by himself to 7 o'clock a.m., and thank you, Tom, for doing that. But uh, through the course of the day, he and I shared three other services, starting out at the Mather and then over here. But in the course of that day, somewhere along the line, we realized, I should say Father Tom realized, that he and I had not gotten our ashes. And so we both agreed, okay, at the next service we'll do that. And, and I was all caught up in trying to be a good priest in, in doing this thing that I've done for 40 years now and, and offering myself to the congregation, to you all. So in, in trying to be this good priest, it still skipped my mind, even to the 7.30 service, and I was going to turn and start uh, giving out ashes, and Father Tom had to stop me again and say, remember your own ashes. And he put the cross on my head with those words. Remember, you are dust. Me, Conrad Selnick, and to dust I shall return. So I wanted to avoid some reason in my subconscious mind, I guess, the, the, that reality and just try and be this good person. But all of that is true at once. And so here we come to the first Sunday in Lent. And uh, the, the, the Old Testament reading for this morning is uh, specifically the story of what we call the fall. The story you're very familiar with, the serpent and, and Eve and Adam and eating the apple. But it is always a preacher's prerogative to add on to the readings assigned. Uh, not really supposed to take to, to cut them, but you can add one. And, and so I asked Richard when he was working on the bulletin to add essentially the beginning of that story and its ending. And that broadens it out to something different. So we go to the, the beginning of what we just heard this morning, and, and Eden is being planted by God in a world that God has already created. God has already, in fact, made Adam out of the dust of the earth and breathed life into him. And in the middle of this verdant earth, God plants Eden, which means in Hebrew delight or pleasure or paradise. And, and paradise itself comes from, I think it's an Aramaic word, that, that, that is, it means the king's personal tended garden, the, the king's hunting ground reserved for the monarch. And having created him, God takes Adam and sets Adam there in Eden. And then Adam is given stewardship all over Eden and access to everything. There are these two trees God has set in the midst of the garden, and one of them, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of moral knowledge, Adam is not supposed to eat that fruit. Well, then we get the serpent and that conversation and the whole cascade of events that comes from that we're also familiar with. And that piece ends with an epiphany and a, 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 a God coming right into Eden in the cool of the evening at the time of the evening breeze. And God is strolling through Eden and comes upon Adam and Eve and their new circumstances, having eaten of the tree of moral knowledge. And the story ends with some heavenly contemplation by God and the expulsion of human beings from Eden and being sent out into the world, pretty much the world as we know it, and the garden being guarded by an armed cherubim. A foundational story. And I'm a big believer that stories usually carry a lot more truth and a lot more intricacy than, say, a list where God would say, get out your pencil and your paper and I'm going to tell you how things are. No, in this foundational story, we get insight into God, into humanity, into us humans, live, humans living under God and in the world, within creation. 
So in this vignette, God has, has done the creating, but is sorting out creation. Already, as I said, made that verdant earth and Adam. And now God makes Eden and sets Adam there. And this detail of the two trees in the midst of Eden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God specifically instructs Adam to enjoy the fruits of any tree in Eden except the one of moral knowledge. Oh, yeah, we fast forward, and, and I left out pieces which would keep us here for a couple more hours, but creating Eve, bone of Adam's bone, flesh of Adam's flesh. And then there's the snake, more crafty than any of the other wild animals. One thing I wonder is, did the snake itself go and nibble at some of the fruit of the tree of moral knowledge? Because that snake seeks out Eve and using lines just as slick as those used by Satan in the wilderness tempting Jesus, the snake entices Eve to taste the prohibited fruit. And when he is offered that fruit, Adam himself puts up no resistance at all. Adam and Eve's eyes are opened primarily to themselves. How human is that? They've been naked all along, but now it bothers them. Puts me in mind a little bit of a line attributed to Mark Twain. No other animal but people, but humans blushes, nor needs to. <laughs> At this pivotal, awkward moment, God strolls around Eden in the cool of the evening. Adam and Eve jumble together some loincloths from the big leaves typical for fig trees. God confronts the two who only answer with blame of someone besides themselves. It was all mush mouth, excuses, and neither confession nor penitence are anywhere to be found. God contemplates the whole episode and its inevitable impact on humanity. And, by the way, provides Adam and Eve with proper garments instead of their slapdash loincloths that they had put together. And then God banishes Adam and Eve from Eden and sets an armed angel at its gate, protecting the tree of life and putting humans out in the wider world beyond the carefree life which was Eden. What is it about those two trees and their attributes? What does this tell us about God? You now the humans then and, and often we humans now focus on what it tells us about humans. But uh, I put in mind there a, a song from Carol King, I'll bet you think this song is about you, don't you? We may think this whole story is just about people, but it's at least as much about God. So God has thrown them out. This God who creates the world and humans goes on to conceive those two fateful trees, although only the tree of the moral knowledge is forbidden in the midst of idyllic Eden, God visits humans in their first crisis and finally make Eden like a guarded temple with the tree of life in its midst while sending humans out into the wider world and into the stream of history. God is concerned that without any wisdom or experience, humans may acquire both moral knowledge and eternal life, having ignored God to get the, the latter in particular. Because then we would be like gods and through what is known as cheap grace. What does this whole story say about humans? Well, I, I, I recall again, Psalm 8, we are made a little lower than the angels, but Genesis 3, we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Both are true, always, at once. Heaven and earth, spirit and body, inseparable in people. Temptation, 
is there and we give in. Oscar Wilde had a great line about this. I can resist anything except temptation. And that enigmatic tree of life, does it offer immortality? And, and if so, what does that mean? Never dying? What about dying and coming back to life? But what about illness and injury and suffering and aging? Where does that fit in? Or is it just understanding the crush of death? Animals seem to sense their own impending death when it's close. And some also seem to grieve the loss of companions. But do they contemplate being dead beyond dying or loss? Does moral knowledge prevent doing wrong or just bring about guilt or our avoidance of guilt? And back to the tree of life. In Hebrew, that word life is to be, being. It's the same word God offers as a name for the deity when Moses stands before the burning bush. I am who I am. And in the book of Revelation, in the new Jerusalem, a colonnade of the tree of life lines both sides of the crystal-like river, and their fruit is for the healing of the nations. And St. Paul, echoing Hebrew scripture again, Hebrew passages, talks about Jesus being hung on a tree for the crucifixion. So the, the human beings, we... We, we got hung up by that tree of moral knowledge and, and almost even more so by the tree of life. What if God himself were stuck by the tree of life, retained there in Eden, but somehow having to be worked out? Is the cross the tree of life? Was God preserving it in Eden until the fullness of time when he himself in the flesh as the incarnate Jesus is nailed to that tree, when God reconciles Psalm 8, we're made a little lower than the angels, and Genesis 3, we are from dust and to dust we shall return. When God reconciles those after Christ Jesus' return, it seems like then we will fully enjoy the eternal sweet fruit of the tree of life. And in the meantime, we're pretty aware of how we humans behave and how we are dust and spirit and focus pretty much, each of us, on our own free will, on ourselves. But God is patient and has been from that foundation. During Lent, we're going to offer a creed that originates in Africa. This congregation is used to having different creeds. I think in the fall, we were reciting the New Zealand, the creed from the New Zealand prayer book. Um, this African creed we offer as a different voice, a different perspective, uh, a different uh, flavor of how we believe as Christians. So I invite you to stand as you are able and join in the African creed. We believe in the one high God, who out of love created the beautiful world and everything good in it, created human beings and wanted humanity to be happy in this world.
prayers of the people are formed too. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for Paula, our bishop, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, for the well-being of all people, for the people of Ukraine, for safety, peace, and strength. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison, and for those on our parish prayer list and those we mention now. Pray for those in any need or trouble. For Samuel, Bob, and Peter, for Kristen. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by our Lord. I ask your prayers for the departed, including the victims of violence, locally and worldwide, and for those who inflicted this violence on our sisters and brothers. Pray for those who have died. In particular, all the victims of this epidemic of gun violence across our nation. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored, especially Dorothy, Tom, Martin, Helen, Elisha, Michael, and Linda. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Almighty God, giver of every good gift, look graciously on your Christ Church, and so guide the minds of those who shall choose a rector for this parish, that we may receive a faithful pastor who will care for your people and equip us for our ministries. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning. Good morning. Special welcome to any guests who are with us today. You'd help us to follow. You'd help us to follow up with your visit if you fill out the a card in the pew. It gives us some contact information. And you're welcome to enjoy our coffee fellowship, which today will be right here in the side cloister, the, the old cloister. Um, and in there, you will find a small, a mini, M-I-N-I, ministries fair. Uh, an opportunity for not only our guests, but the congregation to, to uh, discover the wonderful things that are getting done in, this, in and through this parish, the ways to be involved, <coughs> uh, the ways to, to participate in program, uh, and participate uh, in the mini M-A-N-Y, ministries of this congregation. So please hang around. I'll have coffee and goodies here in the side cloister after the service. We have two resources. Uh, they're aimed at our youth, but, they, but anyone can enjoy them. Two Linton resources. We have a 
a youth Linton growth packet. Uh, there, there, there are soil and seeds here uh, for you to grow a plant, to grow a plant this Lent. And by the way, Lent comes from, uh, from the Gaelic, which means spring. No, Easter means spring. Is that right? Yes. Easter is from the Gaelic that means spring. So you can prepare for Easter by uh, beginning the new growth that I'm already seeing around us uh, at, at this point of the winter. So we have this Lenten growth packet, and it's out here in this cloister uh, up towards the parish, uh, the church house. We also have a Lenten passport. This is a guide through Lent of, of the many offerings we have, uh, especially towards uh, the end of Lent when we have Holy Week with Palm Sunday and Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. But this is a, a guide for the season of Lent. It's, it's aimed at our children, but I think I'm going to use it because I think there's a lot to learn uh, and to be aware of as we go through the Lenten season. So we have a Lenten passport. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where they are, but they're either here at the, at the ministry fair or uh, in the Prevo course today. A correction to Thursday's newsletter, it announced that there would be even song this coming Sunday, a week from today, and that is not correct. The choir is not offering even song uh, this coming Sunday, but a little later in the month, we, the choir is offering a hymnathon. A hymnathon. It'll be on a Saturday, and we're going to sing every single hymn in the hymnal throughout the day. Uh, it's specifically a fundraiser for the choir's trip to Canterbury this summer. So no even song uh, coming up, uh, but pay attention to the hymnathon and join us in that activity. And finally, um, I'm praying for safe travels uh, to Conrad, who tomorrow is headed down to Mexico to with, uh, with a parish that he's been involved with since coming to uh, since coming to the diocese, and that is St. Chrysostom's, uh, they are they're having a mission trip and going down to our companion diocese in southeastern Mexico. So safe travels, sir. We look forward to hear tales of, of your adventures there. And now let us continue to walk in love as Christ has loved us, gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. <laughs>
be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious and holy God, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and maker of all. Jesus stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night, he was handed over to suffering and death. Our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, almighty God, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Christ. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and to serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Savior, by whom, by Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to
Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. gifts of God to the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, remain with you always. Bless the Lord. <laughs> 